You could start talking. Welcome to the Board and Scale podcast, everybody, where we bring you topics every single week without fail. We've never <sighs> missed a week, and we never will. Never. Uh, and if you feel like that may or may not be a lie, then... Um, like and subscribe. Like and subscribe, and then also go back and make sure, go watch all of our other videos, because we clearly say when we're recorded and when they're uploaded. So go ahead and make sure that uh, you go and look at all those, just to kind of keep us honest, you know? Mm. Also, Dwayne's back. Don't do that. He took a hiatus. He was on vacation helping the sick and poor. Um, just kidding. He doesn't help anybody ever. I was. No. Now he helps plants. He does help plants. Our, our friend works in a... Plant. A weed shop. Plant land. Look at him. He's a plant. He is a plant. A government plant. We got earth is. tones on today, baby. Yeah. I'm like a giant tree. Okay. So you ever fucking... <clears throat> have you ever if seen... You ever, if you ever... If you, like... If don't you took tr- all of one color in earth... And built the tree of just the little top parts. That's He's outside me. of the frame. <laughs> just the canopies. Yeah. He's just five canopies stacked on each other. Hey, Dwayne, what color is the bark of a tree? Bark? Bark. Brown. Yeah. You're wearing green. I guess it depends on the tree. Really. It's just I'm covered in moss. Oh, mm. you're a mossy tree. Okay. Yeah. Mossy tree. Okay. Isn't that a... Camo brand. Mossy, Mossy Oak. Tree? Mossy Oak. Oh, Mossy Oak, yeah. Is. That is a, it absolutely is a camo All right, brand. I hope you enjoyed that riveting <laughs> intro. What we have for you now is our weekly highlights where we talk about the games that we played uh, since the last time we got together and really just point out specific ones that were either new or fun or, you know, just kind of uh, stood out a little bit for us. So, Dwayne, since you missed last week, you can go ahead and go first. I've played it twice. In the same week, my weekly highlight is Arc Nova. Arc Nova. It's a good one. Do you want to talk about it? I'm sure everybody knows about the game. God damn, I love that game. I just finally now just got Marine World. So I was a fucking idiot for not getting it when I had the chance when it first came out. When every store had everything, an abundance of them. Yeah. Um, so I just got my local board game store to sell me someone else's copy. <laughs> we, we played, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Explain that. Yeah. Somebody had it on hold and they were like, do you want it? I was like, uh, I'm not going to say anything cause I don't want to take it. And he was like, just sell it to him. I was like, all right, fuck it. I'll take it. What's, I mean, we won't. Docs the store out there, yeah. but like, what's their policy? Was it like on hold for like a long time, and they just hadn't come it was to on, pick it up? Or it was on like hold that? for a while, and the person who was holding it also had like fucking eight other shit held behind the counter. He was like, "I'll fucking take care of them." How let's does get, this kind of hold on? Let's make let's make that a topic. I mean, let's talk about it right now. You want to talk about it right now? Yeah, I mean, it's hot right now. Okay, it's on the- so do you guys first of all? Ever have games held for you? More, plenty of times. Okay. Online. Okay. That's different, though. It's in yeah. the warehouse regardless, yeah. right? But for a game that is at a physical store where people walk in and might purchase something on a whim, mm-hmm. to have multiple games held in the back for you, I will I will tell people, I will tell stores, I'll call on a day, hey, do you have this? Yeah. Can you hold it for me? Yeah. Because I am, I I am literally going to leave my house right there, and go and pick it up for that explicit purpose. Yes, 100%. yeah, yeah. Yep. That's crazy to have eight games held, and you know what? At a local place. At a local place. Like, what's the what's the? So I guess I mean I don't want to say I don't want to like you know out the store or whatever, uh, but like, what's the policy? What do you know? You can you can just hold shit. You can just be like, hey, bruv, I don't want to pay for this. But can you hold it until I feel like paying for it? Pretty much. That's dumb. And if you can't. As a business model to me, that's psychotic. Yeah, that's kind of like detrimental. Do you have to be a member? Do you have to pay for some kind of like. That's actually a good question. Service? I don't know. 
Because like, I am, but I don't know. If if there was a store that had some kind of like customer service type like, or like customer loyalty type thing where you pay like, like memberships. Yeah, where you pay like X dollars a month or a quarter or a year or whatever it is. I could see that being a perk, a bonus, right? Like, hey. Unlimited but, holds? Uh, I would, well, again, if I'm a small brick and mortar place, I'm still going to put a limit on that. Like five pieces of content, right? Dude, five games. five whatever. is a lot. It is. And, and that can add up. But like, you can begin to like. It, it, I don't it, know if I'd have a limit on how much. I'd have a limit on how long. Like, if you don't get this in, like, the next five days, I'm going to put it back on the Five days is tight. I mean, give people, people a month. Give people a month. I will hold an Because, like, Barnes & Noble, they'll hold your shit for three days. And they'll put it back out if you don't come and get it. Dude, I feel so That's bad noble, if I ask someone to you. hold something and then something comes up immediately and I'm like, now I'm going to be an hour late. I feel horrible. I, I and I get that. I, th- I mean, like I understand your your take on it. And I think that's a good take to have. I think the problem is is that most people don't see it that way. They see it as so. First of all, like okay, so we're talking about a brick and mortar place that almost positively is going to cost more money even after shipping than most online game stores, right? For the most part, you're going to pay more at a brick and mortar store than you do online. Right. You are specifically, yes, but he has a normally. What, what I'm getting normally. at is, is that, okay, so like if I'm the consumer and I'm going to pay five, ten more dollars for a game to support my local game store, I, I can understand how a person might begin to rationalize that that store owes them something a little extra, right? You don't also, hold it for me. I don't agree with it. Again, I'm not saying I agree with it, but I can begin to understand a person's rationality to be like, Hey, yeah, I'm just, uh, hey, hold this game for me. I'll pick it up whenever I feel like it three months down the line. I also didn't specifically look at what was back there. I don't know if it was like full on games or if he was just holding like expansions. sleeves yeah. or like expansions or or uh, like fucking card uh, packs or whatever. Sure. I didn't look at exactly what, but I know it was a lot of stuff he had held. I back just feel there. like, like even then, you know. What are you waiting for? Are you waiting for you're, you're like, hey, I'm waiting for my paycheck to come in so I can buy these eight things from you and spend two hundred dollars, maybe, and then, I put, and then put eight more things on hold. At this same you place, I was be buying that many. You know, at like, the same place, I was holding something for a while, but at the same time, I was paying for it slowly. Like each time I went in the store, I yeah. would put a little bit towards. Yeah, what I was holding because it was expensive. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think that's a. I mean, this is. There's something to be said for the fact that, like, I think most of us are in a position, for the most part, for most of our games, to be able to, like, hey, like, I want to buy this game. You just go buy it. Right? There's not a whole lot of like, well, you know, I gotta, I gotta squirrel away. So we're we're pretty fortunate in that regard. So like, I can understand where people are like, I really want to own this game and I want to support this place, so I want to buy it from them. The only way to guarantee that's going to happen is that is you hold it for me or whatever. Like, I don't know. I see. I see a lot of. I see potential value in in the practice all the way around. But I I think it'd also be very reasonable for a a, a store owner to be like, look, either put limitation on space, uh, limitation on time, uh, things like that. Because the other thing too is is that like if if I buy a board game if I'm in the store. And I purchase a game, and I don't sell it. That's just and that's just not in, that's income I'm not making, right? I'm holding this and I'm not making the money on this. And then, God forbid, let's just say it's a newer game, and <clears throat> the hype goes out of it. Now you're stuck with physical copies of games that have people have moved on from. And what if that person is like, actually, I kind of moved on from it too. You can take it off hold. I don't want it. Yeah, and it just sat there the entire time. There's no penalties for that. Which is why, again, like to me, the only way that you begin to enter this conversation is by um, putting in strict limitations. Like, so, like, even online. So, Miniature Market, where I do, frankly, most of my online shopping, you can do the customer hold. Um, but the, I think there are limits on it. I don't know. They've changed their policies, and they're, they're probably going to change them again because the company just changed hands again. 
Um, I can't remember what they are, but like the other thing though is that you pay for the game up front. Like I've given them all my money. So if that game You're just sits, waiting for free shipping. Exactly. So if that game sits on their shelves, like now all I'm doing is paying for shelf space. And obviously they've they've picked the middle of F nowhere, Missouri, I think. Yeah. And are able like built large warehouses to be able to accommodate that kind of practice. I mean, heck, they're even they're doing distribution for Kickstarters now. At any rate. I think if you're doing it like if you if you have a bunch of stuff back there, but you're coming in once a week and being like, hey, here's 20 bucks towards my my total. Here's 20 bucks. That to me makes sense. And then the store is like with every we every time that you come by, they're getting a little more assurance in the sale, mm-hmm. you know, as like a, kind of a security for the store. It's not it's hard. to It's hard to survive as a brick and mortar store. Small business in general. Right. Yeah. Even more, I feel like as a board game store where there's also five, six other board game stores competing, you know? Yeah. So I don't know. I think eight's crazy. If you hold, comment if you hold games or not, what you think (laughs) about it. I do hold games. Fairly often. At places that allow you to. Because some don't. Some don't allow you to. Yeah. But But when I do... You pay, you have a membership at that place we're talking about. Yes. So you're paying towards a service regardless. And... Brick and mortar stores, you are you can you can build a personal relationship with some you know yeah with the employees sometimes, and I know that you have some kind of relationship with them where they know who you are. You're not just like a random person that goes mm-hmm. in the store and it's like, hey, hold all my stuff, you know. They know you, mm-hmm. so benefit of having that personal relationship is like they can risk something like that. I think with you, right? But imagine if someone who just is like, oh, I just moved, I just moved here. They walk in the store and they're like, oh, I'm not going to do the membership yet because I want to like see what my schedule, my pay is going to be like. But I noticed you have this, this, and this. You mind holding it for me? And then they just don't come back for a month and it's like $200 worth of stuff. Yeah. You know, like when does the store decide, okay, this needs to Barnes go back Noble. on the shelf? Three days. Three days. I that's think it? that's fine. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you don't have a, if you don't have a program or something like that, that's a very different thing. They uh, move, your, move your chair forward about an inch. I know you ain't got a lot of room, but every time you're moving, the whole book, the game case is shaking behind you. <laughs> Big fella. Well, no, it's, it has literally nothing to do. I mean, you do the same thing. It's just the fact that his, his chair his is chair's in contact canted, with it. Yeah. So as, he, as he's moving, I'm watching the whole thing. <laughs> Bumping and jiving. Bumping and jiving. Okay. Well, you guys have anything more to say about that? No. I, I yeah, yeah. Right. Well, that was Dwayne's weekly topic. <laughs> the game of holding the same game at a bunch of different stores. Crazy. Nah, I'm just kidding. All right. Waiting for one of them to go on sale. You want to go ahead, Kip? Yeah. So um, I think my, my highlight was probably Foundations of Rome. It's um, it's really like I, one of those ones where, hey, it's Rome. It looks really pretty. It's basically a polyomino, right? Yeah. But with big minis. Yep. It's um, the closest game that I know that you can like uh, uh, similar to would be um, Chinatown. Um, in that, like you're collecting, you're gaining rights to to spaces and then building buildings on those spaces. And if you play with the different modules, you can do trading and stealing and stuff. Um, so the trading aspect basically makes it almost identical, except for the fact that you can build and overbuild. Um, spaces in Foundations of Rome, so it's not as like limited or strict. Um, but it's really not a complicated game. Um, the rules are really simple, as you pointed. Like Dwayne, Dwayne had played it before, and he's like, "Yeah, it's a real simple game." And I was like, "That's surprising because it's a huge table present." Definitely got the huge production, highest fucking size to simplicity ratio in a game I've ever seen. Yeah, I. I would probably give I I would absolutely say that for the size of the box, especially when you if you boil it down to just a base game, because you don't have to play with the modules, you mm-hmm. know, with the monuments and the invocations and the bless or was it the the roll cards and the objective cards, a bunch of really simple add-ons. You don't have to play with them, but if you play with just the base game, it is just a brutally simple game. Like you do one of three things on your turn, and that's basically it. You do that three times in an era. Free eras or whatever, and it's super simple. 
Um, but it is elegant. It is fun when you do add the additional content into it. I've never played it with just the base game. Honestly, I don't think I would ever want to. Um, we played with everything that you could play with, and that was enough complexity. Why wouldn't you? You're pulling that big old box out? You may as well. I, well, especially because, like, so the first time for me, like, pulling it out, looking at it, being, like, reading through the real bo- rule book and being like, oh, this is, is this is as simple as, as Dwayne said it was going to be. Like, this is dumb easy. Um, and then being like, all right, well, okay. What, what is it? What do these things add and how much complexity is it going to add to the game? And being like, oh, you just pick an objective and you try to get to it. Great. Oh, you pick a role. The role is active throughout the game. Great. Monuments. Okay, you put some monuments out and you can try to build them if you meet the criteria. Uh, invocations. You shuffle them into the deck and if they become available and you want to buy them, you can. Um, I think that's it. Oh, trading and stealing. You can you can tr- freely trade um, plots and cards and favor tokens. And then, like, the most complicated thing was stealing, mm-hmm. where, like, if you had two orthogonally adjacent spots, if somebody had a deed marker on it, not a building, just a deed marker, you could take a, a, a level two token, a uh, victory point token, and turn it over to a four token and give it to them and then steal that spot. Um. So a bunch of really simple stuff. But again, when you put it all together, it becomes it's still very elegant and still works really well. And then of course, the big selling point is it's absolutely gorgeous. The the buildings, especially the the washed buildings, are just absolutely beautiful. Um, huge table hog, of course, but I mean, it's all about table presence. So yeah. glad I own it. Um yeah, I um uh, totally forgot that there's an expansion coming out for it. The the roads of something or is whatever. There really? Yeah, it's another they did a second Kickstarter. Another one of those games where it did well enough in its first run that everyone was like that missed it was sad. Wants a rerun yep. anyway. Yeah. So they were like, "Hey, you guys want to spend money on it? We'll we'll give it to you." So they did a they did a second print run and then they added some small additional content. So yeah, Foundations of Rome. That's my uh, that's my pick of the week. Well, I want to sneak in a topic there when you talked about just playing the base game or expansions. Mm. How do you guys feel about when a game has a oh, if this is your first time playing, play this version instead, or or don't add in these instead? It depends on the group for me. Mm. Like if I'm playing with people who don't play games like we do, then I'll do that. You'll do, you'll you'll do play the, with the beginner version. Yeah, play with this side of the board. Play with these sets of cards, whatever. But if it's like if we're playing a game and it's us, we'll just play the normal. Just throw everything in, whatever. Yeah, we're we're good. We're good to go. Yeah, if it's I, I agree. the 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 group The group matters. Now the distinction. I'll make a subtle distinction. Um, I'm not sure if it was intended or not, but like. When a rule book trims down the basic rules for starters versus if you just happen to have gotten a Kickstarter or something that includes additional optional content, do you throw the content in or not? To me, the answer is no. I always want to play the base game like, on oh, its own. Oh, here's plus four modules if you want. Correct, yeah. Like if it's not required for the game, it's an optional thing. you got to read extra rules. Nine times out of ten, I'm gonna go ahead and say, "Hey, let's let's play the base game, get an understanding for the base game, figure out if it's worth it, um, and then move on to adding additional content." I think for me, it probably depends on like the complexity of the game and how prepared I am to teach it. Right, mm-hmm. like the group. Uh, you know, I play the games I want to play. Mm-hmm. Um, so generally, like you guys know that, you and you guys know the kind of games that I play. Just talking about you guys specifically, right? So if I'm like, okay, I want to play, for example, right, Hegemony. I know that you guys can play that. So if there is something that's, oh, here's a starter version or just the regular version, I'm doing the regular version, you know? Yeah. Tricarian has the base the base game that they recommend you play with for your first game, which basically just removes the Dark Alley part of the board. Sure. And that specifically, when I was like reading about it and trying to, learn how to play it a lot of the recommendations were like just it's not much more it adds it adds to the game just learn it right because you get the special 
location cards that have the abilities, whatever. And it's really not that much extra to add. I don't even know why they would do that. You know, for it's already a hard game. I, it's already complicated. I. What's that one more step? I mean, I actually have to disagree. I think. I mean, I do think adding the dark alley stuff is an additional layer of complexity. Again, I think it's welcome, and I think if you're if you're able for the most for most people, I think if you can strap in and, and play Tricarian, you're you're fine with it, right? Um, but even for me, like the first time through, and even the second time through, like the tokens as they're rotating, mm-hmm. you know, you're not really paying super close attention to them. And again, unless you're sitting next to that part of the board and they're like right in front of you, um, and then the, the layer of complexity that comes with knowing when to best use the dark alley cards for your action cards, right? To know, okay, hey, this is the best time for me to use this this special theater card that I've got, right? I think that that does make it harder. I'm not saying impossible, but if you're looking for an area that you could cut out, you could cut out the dark alley without compromising the core integrity of the game and it would objectively make it simpler. That being said, first time you taught us, you taught it with Dark Alley. Second time we played, first time his first time we played Dark Alley. I, don't, I think it's fine, but again, you got to know who you're playing with. I think it depends on the game. That one, Fair. I was like, it's already a hard ass game. I'm just gonna do it all. Sure, you know. Yeah, if you if your eyes glaze over by the time you get to the marketplace, you're fucked anyway. <laughs> Something that I saw that I liked that's in it's in Wormspan. I feel like I've seen it in another game, but I know it's in Wormspan for sure. They have the the cards for beginners where it's like mm. this is what you should do on your first couple turns. Yeah. Uh, I like that. I like that a lot. Well, that's great because you can just you it's there, you look at it, it gives you a general idea of like how to navigate through those first couple turns and then, you know, once a player's played the game one time, they never have to look at it again. You know, instead of, yeah, like instead of a, a the teacher having to be like, oh, this is what you might do. You have a card that is, yeah. You know. Again, it's, it's kind of ironic that you, I mean, I think, I think you've changed your mentality, even in the, you know, the short amount of time that I've known you, I think you've started to change your mentality towards coaching players when it's more complicated. Because earlier, like, if I, if I would have had this conversation four months ago, I think you were vehemently opposed to the idea of being like, hey, this You're is... just like, figure it out. Yeah. You just, hey, just just dive in, figure it out, whatever. Um, and I think for, for lighter games, I think that's probably fine. But I think you started to notice that with, with a couple more complicated games, if you let players wallow in ignorance, they're not going to enjoy it as much. And if you want them to enjoy it, you got to give them a little bit. And it's great when the game does it because the game is agnostic, right? It's not like no one can accuse you of being like, oh, you gave that player that advice because that advice is good for you, <laughs> right? It's agnostic. It's just, hey, do this or this, then do this or this, then do this or this. So then it's then also like if this. you have cards in your hand, I don't want to look at your cards yeah, because now I know what you have. Yeah. yeah. Like, that definitely yeah, I'm helping you, but like now I kind of got that advantage. I mean, some games that matters a lot more than others. Let's be honest. A worm span, wingspan, doesn't That's matter. Fair. I don't care. Yeah, you could you could play that game open hand with whatever birds, mm. dragons, or things that are in your hand, for the most part, and it's not going to make that big of a difference. Now, obviously, the, the the more expert you get to where you're like, oh, I know exactly what you're trying to do with those different types of birds, and I'm going to find a way to steal all of the food out of the bird feeder. Well, no, the ones that are like, oh, if you're whoever, at, for however many predators there are, you get this, you know, like stuff like that. Dude, if you're playing, if you. Maybe I, like a two player game, <laughs> yeah. but three and more, I don't give a goddamn about your board. <laughs> Seriously, you've got, look, if you are, if you're playing counter to your opponent to spite your opponent in a three or four player game or a five player game of wing or worm span. It's also just not that kind of game either. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So you know, I just want to talk about that. You know, my highlight this week. Honestly, I don't even have a highlight. Kind of a damp week for me. Boom Lake. You know, moist. I don't even want to say that. Not even. Little. Not even. <laughs> no. What's it called? Heaven and Ale. 
kind of just uh, in the muck a little bit with yeah. games, you know, recovering from sickness and just not really having the energy to learn and play a lot and um, kind of just getting pooped on. Oh. What do we uh, in the games that we played recently? So I don't really have a, actually, what do you know we what? Play I'll give it to having a nail. Yeah. Uh, playing that one. Really? Again, for the first time was just a nice little comeback. I didn't win that one either, but it was just nice to play, pull that game out and play again. Um, you played that one together? I did play Orleans. Was, we uh, played that together? We played that together? Oh, no. Yeah, just none of it felt really... Zoo King, bro? <laughs> heaven and Ale. The I word do, goes to Heaven and Ale. I do like Zoo King. Yes. Too late now? You committed. But it goes to Heaven and Ale. Baby's first Dark Nova. my head, so, you know, feels good. But it's a great game. Yeah, we already talked about that one last week, so I guess it's probably... Which one? Heaven and Ale. Yeah. Because we had the whole me refusing to acknowledge that... Wait, we didn't record ever, last week. Two weeks ago, then. Yeah. You guys had played it, and um, Ken was convinced that she had told me she wanted to play it, and... No. Nope. All nope. right. Well, I'm going on to the next topic, which is... Bum, 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 bum. Trivia! As always, oh, uh, we have three questions slash, you know, items for trivia. And Name this designer's favorite game. That's subjective. Some of the, oh, oh, no, I mean, no, your, no, your explanation was that if that information is readily available on the internet, it's a fair game. So Yeah. Okay. So Let's we have our this. competitors. Um, Dwayne, I think, what's your record? Do you know? I know mine. I think I've won one. Kevin I'm has never zero. won a single game, so this is going to be a you know battle for the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, I'm just trying to. At this point, I might as well finish the season out at uh, at, at, at uh, perfect big zero. Goose egg, so get I can get the first dra- first round draft pick perfect next sweep. season. Yeah. yeah, I won the first one, and I think that was the only one. That I won. <laughs> oh yeah, because I didn't play that one. Oh yeah, because you were the. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Right, well, you guys ready? Yeah, let's Our do Our first this. question. I guess I should have the microphone on. It works pretty well. Not going to lie. I mean, it helps if you're not as tall, but, you know, you get down in the real deep black. Get down in Our dirty. first question is, when was D&D first published? What year? Shit. Let's go ahead and take a guess. For a lot of these, it's going to basically be closest wins. Fuck. D&D? Yep. D&D. Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> Dungeons. You got yours? <laughs> yeah. All right. And let's My see. guess is 1977. 1976. Oh, it fuck. It is 1974. Dang, boy. Created by American game designers Ernest Gary Gygax. and Gary David Gygax. And David Arneson in 1974, published that year by Gygax's company, Tactical Studies Rules. Oh, yeah. Have you seen the movie? The yes. new one with Chris yeah, Pine? Good. It's a good one. Yeah, it's, it was fun. Honestly, it's really good. It was fun. It's just a good movie. Here's a here's a nod to Kevin a little bit. The game was acquired in 1997. Oh, fuck. Never mind. <laughs> Did you just give up the next one? There question? was just a seven no. in there. No nods to Kevin. <laughs> I thought it was 70. I thought it was going to be 77. No. <laughs> 1997, it was acquired by Wizards of the Coast. Oh, yeah. A subsidiary yeah. of Hasbro. Yeah. Wizards yeah. of the Coast, who owns... Magic the Gathering. Yeah. Now Critical Role has made their own. Gadget the uh, Mathering. TTRPG system called Daggerheart. No one cares about Critical Role. Okay. Who well, are they I and do. why does anyone care? They are like the biggest Just fucking kidding. group of D&D players ever. I'm sorry. This is So D&D players are one of those things where like I love my groups. I love D- any, any RPG. I love my group. But like everybody else's group is just kind of weird. Dude, it's one of the seen, most self-loathing have you things seen on the planet. An episode of D of Critical Role. No, it's like it's just no. they make watching it's people just, play D and D so. It's fun. just I have it's no just, doubt. Do you like storytelling? Yeah. Do you like watching someone tell a story? Because they're also it's a group. They're a whole bunch of friends of voice actors too. Yeah. yeah. So like they're very into it. Yeah. And like they're the story's nice. Matthew Mercer, yeah. fucking the. I'm sure. I'm the sure it's DM cool. God. I'm sure it's cool if you're into that stuff. I'm also not even. A, I'm not really a huge fan of D and D. That's fair. Mm. You know. Yeah. So this nine, is not something that nine times out of ten. No, let's say this. Ninety nine times out of a hundred, I'd rather play a board game than D and D than an any RPG. Yeah. 
Unfortunately, I'm also like that with uh, social deduction games. Yeah. That, well, re- that requires. I, I, I like the idea of RPGs, and they can be done really well. I think, obviously, like having a really good DM makes a big, big difference. But to me, the biggest, the key big, like the biggest difference is the group and having everybody equally invested in the gameplay. And the chemistry be right. It's just hard. Like, I've also, I'm full, full disclosure, I've actually only ever played in person like two or three times. And three or four times now. Yeah. Cause we did our, that one a couple months ago or a month ago or whatever. And that makes it a lot better. But like, you know, people who are using voices and really staying in character and like not coming out of the meta, you know, or into the meta, you know, to ask questions and getting to that level, it's really difficult. And like, I've just never had anything even remotely close to that. You don't like, you you don't like being in character. You don't like acting. No, I like that. That's what I'm saying. I want to be in character. I want to be acting. I want to be using a voice. I want to spend as much of my time thinking about life as that persona engaging with the world around me but the difficulty is is that if everybody's not at that level it's difficult or it's it's harder to maintain that yeah because i'm i'm here talking in my wee little voice and you're just like um that's cringe dude well no, <laughs> and somebody's like oh yeah um hey uh, how can i do this and it's like man don't don't ask the t- don't want to just do just add, just say yeah, you're like, going to do a thing and the DM will tell you hey, what to do. Roll yeah. the die, do this, or you can't do that, or whatever. This happens. Like just so, what extreme. happens if I walk into the store? Exactly. What's in there? Yeah, and and I'm good at this is a teaching piece too, and that's part of the th- part of it, right? You got to teach players how to play and how to play how to role play. But I don't know. It's, it's investment. We'll see. We'll see if we can get uh, get our Thursday night group doing it. Right. I would I would shoot for something that's not D and D. Yeah. There's another um, whatever later on. <laughs> okay, our next question. question, question two. How many um, games and expansions are there listed Ever. on Board Game Geek officially for the series? By Gamelin Games, Tiny Epic. This is a good one. How many games, that is a good expansions, one. and expansions? Yep, are listed in the Tiny Epic series. This includes announced Gamelin. games that are yet to be out into the public. What's the What's the well, Tiny Epic Game of Thrones? Is their next? Title, I think there's a lot of them. Starter. Well, they just finished Tiny Epic Cthulhu, which C- will be the first and only game I own with a fucking spinner. Cthulhu. It's got I'm a spinner. Not, it's got a spinning. It's got a spinner. And I'm he, not backing biome. He's playing Quelf. Yep. <laughs> All right. What do you got? Let's see. Sixty. Kevin with the sixty. <laughs> this is a who gets closest. Dwayne with <laughs> eighteen. So I think there's at least like. 27 to 35 base titles. I could only count almost, five. And almost every title has a has an expansion. Here's the thing. When I looked this up, I was also extremely surprised because I also only thought there was like seven or eight, no. you know? What the And I was like fuck? thinking, oh, if there's expansions for, there's like one expansion for each one. So maybe like 15, you know, close to 20. The answer is 71. My God. God, what games the- and yeah. expansions that have been published or announced. I could only think of Pirates, Galaxies, Vikings. Did they got mechs, dinosaurs, tactics, mafia? Dinosaur- dude, there's so many oh, different dude, ones. Dude, now that you fucking said, listen yeah. to Mafia, yeah. you could just say Tiny Epic and any <laughs> random word, <laughs> and it's probably a Tiny I Epic said game. Cthulhu, Game of Thrones, Kingpins, now, Tiny Epic Kingpins. That's a thing. Yeah. Tiny Epic mechs. Yeah, there's. So, I mean, it's funny because the only reason I remember this is because, like, it was even close was because there, I just backed Tiny Epic Cthulhu, uh, like a month or so ago. And I remember seeing something in, I think it was in one of the, the review g- videos, uh, by like Rado runs through it or something like that or whatever. And they were like, oh, yeah, like, in, of course, you know, in the, in the backer kit, you'll be able to get access to, or the pledge managers, you'll get access to all of their other titles, which includes like 27 different games. 
So I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. And then I started thinking about like, all right, so I have Vikings and Vikings has Ragnarok. Um, Galaxies has at least one or two different expansions. Um, and I just started thinking, I'm like, I'm pretty sure uh, Cthulhu included an expansion or two like in the Kickstarter as well. Mm -hmm. So like, I'm like, dude, each, everyone's got at least one. Some of them probably have more than one. So 71 is the answer, and yeah. that doesn't surprise me. So, all right, all right. true tiebreaker. Hey, we are all tied up, and I have the ultimate oh, smackdown it. here at the end for the oh. tie break oh. game. So the okay. way this is going to work, I actually have a name off going. So what's going to happen God. is because Kevin answered the most recently the most recent question correctly he will get to go first or actually no you get to decide if you want to go first or second <laughs> here is the topic another rules first yeah you guys are going to take turns until some until <laughs> someone gets one right and the other doesn't so if you both are are, are wrong you keep going okay okay and you get to decide if you want to go first or second. Okay. I'm going to have you guys name off Monopoly location games. Oh, you mean like, is, is does this location actually exist? Like the spinoffs? E yes, the Monopoly location <laughs> spinoffs. It can be... We're going to stick to real life geographical locations. Okay. Okay. So, Kev, you get to decide if you want to go first. I'll, I'll let him go first. You're going to let Duaneo go first. All right, mm -hmm. Duaneo, you're going to go first, and I'm going to be searching for these. <laughs> so, here's yeah. the thing. So, where are you searching on these? Is there like an official, like, I am searching licensed... through the BG Stats app for the ad game, which pulls through BGG. I, and that is what I am counting. I am going to challenge that. Um, well, right on its face, you can challenge it off the record because <laughs> I'm only taking BGG. Well, no entries because like I grew up with one from the little tiny town I grew up in, and I guarantee that's not on there. No, it's not. So think bigger. <laughs> that's fucking bullshit. It's a licensed monopoly game. <laughs> no, it's not. It's a scam. Okay, dude. Whatever. There's literally hundreds Just say it and, and hundreds see, of other. Go say it and see if it's on there. Well, and no, because if I'm wrong, that's it, right? If you're if you're both wrong in a round, All or right. sorry, if one of you is right and the other is wrong, that's it. All right. Round one. Go ahead, Dwayne. We'll start with one that I actually own: San Antonio. Ooh, Monopoly. San Antonio. Oh well, it's not called that. It is real. Okay. Published in 2007. You, you yourself can own the Riverwalk on the Riverwalk of San Antonio. Los Angeles. Los Angeles. <laughs> Don't sound so excited, Kev. <laughs> Los Angeles. Watch it not be one. <laughs> oh, I misspelled. One. It's just fucking over. It is real. Published in 2006, and actually, it's the second version. There was one in 1996. Yeah, I mean, that's got to be one of okay. Los Angeles. All right, round two. Can I make a s say something? What? If it doesn't show up initially, like if you say Monopoly Los Angeles and it doesn't show up, can you try like Los Angelesopoly? <laughs> Oh yeah, that's funny because the the one I mentioned is 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 like that. Because mine, the one I have is that, San Antonioopoly. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, we can do that. I mean, sure. I mean, the point is, is the game is supposed to exist. I mean, you just asked us for the cities, so like how it's named, I don't think that matters. Yeah. All right, Dwayne. All right, Dwayne. We're gonna go. Pick Already something. lost. <laughs> so the geography quiz now, man. I feel like I feel like Georgia has one. The okay. state of Georgia. I feel like it. You know what? Here's it might thing. just be the whole state of Georgia. There's probably Monopoly Georgia. Not real. Georgiaopoly. 
I will look up Georgia Opoly for you. <laughs> Because I, I feel like I feel like I've no, seen probably, a Monopoly board with a fucking Georgia, bulldog on it somewhere. It, yeah, because that's probably Georgia Opoly <laughs> does not exist. Kev, you can win it all. Oh here. man, my first one. Watch me screw this up. Let's go with Miami. Monopoly Miami. Home of old people and nightclubs. Monopoly Miami. Search. See, it's funny because, like, I know there's one that the city I grew up in, but I'm not confident that it's listed. Monopoly on there. Miami, published in 2004, and with that, Monopoly My first W. The, Mon- the Monopoly off is over. Hey, so you did this on BGG through BG Stats. Well, but it, it pulls, which pulls from BGG, through BGG. Right? Yeah, All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna look this. You're gonna look up. for yours. Nope. See. It's a good thing up. you didn't do it. Yeah. So. Oh my God! It's the fucking University of Georgia. Dogopoly. That's what it is, man. That's some bullshit. That is tough. Would you All have right. accept? Would you have accepted Target? <laughs> <laughs> no, dude, I would not. Have. So, dude, this is wild, man. I can get. I'm, dude, I might have to get this. What this a is, collectible uh, version of yours. Camarillo Opoly. So Camarillo, California is that a looks pretty. Uh, tiny little city north of Ventura, um, between Ventura and Oxnard, and it's it's where I grew up in Southern California. And I just re- remember it was like that the fact that we had one was wild to me because like it's not a big city. Yeah. Right. Would you have accepted University of Georgia? I would not have. Come on. That's a that's a building, dude. <laughs> <laughs> just a building. A bu- That's basically a, a post office. A like bu- imagine doing USPS. Dude, Opoly. universities might as well Singular at this point be fucking mini cities. USPS Opoly. Hey, uh, how, how big? How big was? Um, how big is UTSA? How many students? Uh, I don't know. That's a great hundred. question. I have no fucking idea. It's it's like a small apartment. Well, right, because <laughs> University of Texas is one of the top five. Just for population. Like student Attendance. population wise, yeah, I think um, UCF Central Florida I think is now the largest school in the country with like over a hundred thousand students. I would have thought it was B- BYU with all those baby makers. No, <laughs> so back back all those soakers back <laughs> back when I was going to school, um, believe it or not, Minnesota was the third largest school with like sixty five thousand students. Minnesota. Minnesota. University of Texas at Austin is very is one of the largest, and then Ohio State is one of the other biggest. All right, yeah. well, yeah, who I cares? Bonus trivia. Colleges are a waste of time. I knew I saw it. the world dog. is going to fold in on I itself, it. <laughs> and none of it will be worth anything. So play games and like this video. That's all that matters. That's true. <laughs> With the end of trivia and Kevin's first ever win, thanks for ruining it, Dwayne. Seriously. Fuck you. <laughs> I mean, come on, man. University of Georgia. The Where University of Georgia is a specific place. That's well a building, it. dude. No one cares. Should have counted. Literally, no one cares about the University of Georgia except college football people. It's true. That's absolutely one. Tr- and those true. people are brainlets, okay? Hey. Oof. Wow. I don't know what. I don't know what that means. That's a that's a hey, the Rock shirt. That's fine. I get it. One of his brand. It makes sense. It makes sense. I don't know what he said. He was just mumbling into the mic. He said you were born in a time where inflation was not necessarily a worry. <laughs> and now that we're now that we're fifty years into the future, uh, <laughs> yeah, man, it's been quite the surprise. When what? was the first time that you had a practical experience with inflation? Oh God! This not this is no 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 no. In, Next question. On, just housing, honestly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where I have like a, a literal like historical graph of in the inflation ho- of housing prices. Yeah, you know. For me, is the invention of the McDouble. Oh, because they used to be eighty nine cents, and now they're like three dollars. Uh, so a uh, so it used to be the double cheeseburger used to be a dollar on the dollar menu. And um, they had to increase the price, but they wanted to keep a double cheeseburger type thing on the dollar menu. So they invented the McDouble, which is a double cheeseburger with one piece of cheese instead of two pieces of cheese. Smaller scale. Yeah. So for like a couple years or whatever it was, it lasted. The McDouble 
was the dollar one, and the double cheeseburger was like a dollar thirty or forty or something like that. And I was like, "Wow, this is it. This is how. This is what inflation means." <laughs> you know what? <laughs> More expensive cheeseburgers. McDonald's is also probably a good indicator for me for that because of the yeah. McDouble. Because when I grew up in high school, the McDouble was a dollar. Yep. Now it's not. Yep. Now it's almost three dollars. So there's a there's actually a um, I don't know what it's called, but like there's a like an idea, like an index. Basically, it's the, the buying power, like compared to a, um, like or how much how much does it um, can like a dollar or ten dollars or whatever buy you for for Big Macs? The idea basically being that like a Big Mac is a relatively universal value everywhere you go in the country like in the world right like a big mac is a big mac is a big mac is a big mac yeah so like by like portion of your income like how many big macs can you buy so it really starts to let you know like what the buying power how sad your life is of a currency is right so like yeah i worked eight hours today and i can afford five big macs (laughs) exactly yeah yeah Hey, Dwayne, remember the time we had a conversation about freaking the how much money board games made? Yeah. It's basically the same thing. We're not talking about board games. We're talking about Big Macs. Well, yep. see, the how thing many is Big, that Macs Big Macs is are your now, board game worth? Big Macs are being made out of cardboard now, so it's kind of relevant, <laughs> you know? Uh, and uh, that's fine. We'll move on. <laughs> With our next topic. Are you sure this next topic is a little too intellectual for Dwayne? I don't know if he's going to enjoy this one. Is it artificially intellectual? It might be. We're going to go into AI art and how we feel about it and how, perhaps how you feel about it, you know? Yeah. Um, Dwayne, what so, are your thoughts? Well, first of all, a little, little quick backstory. So, I mean, this came up as a topic for us, for those of you who don't know. So, Awaken Realms is doing for Puerto Rico what they did for Castles of Burgundy, and they're doing a glitzed up uh, printing of it. Um, and they did their, a Waking Realms 24 next, whatever, basically they, sh- they showcase like a, all like the next 10 games or whatever it is that they're going to do for the next year or something like that. And they didn't really have a whole lot of content around Puerto Rico, but one of the, a couple of the things were, were some artwork pieces and whatnot. And <laughs> a user was like, this looks weird. That person has six fingers, which is one of like the telltale signs that somebody's using AI generated art and like a wheel was like coming out of somebody's butt. Just things being slightly off. Yep. So um, somebody, people were calling them out and of course they, they pulled it immediately. Um, so that started some people talking about uh, like how dare they as a big company. Yeah. Use AI art. Yeah. So death of the small creator. Yeah. So Dwayne, you want me to take it? What? The, the topic. Let me take the reins. I actually well, heard. I know people don't like AI art, or not fond of it. Okay, because it's like it's that <sighs> pulling from. It's like splicing together existing art, yeah, and kind of just making its own thing out of that. Yeah. So I know that's why. No, at least that's what I know about people not being too fond of AI art. Um, I don't think. I don't think a big a big company should be doing that. A big company who's going to make a million dollars off of a campaign should not be spend some shit on an artist. Essentially essentially stealing potentially, right? Almost guaranteed art styles even directly copying art from other artists, you know? So this is where I think there's a again worth having a conversation about like the intellectual property and the aspect of how AI art is generated. So it really does matter about which AI engines and models you're using um, because some of them have limitations on them that are deliberately placed on them to protect protected artwork. So if you put things into like if, if I I don't, I don't, again, I don't know enough about it, but like, I know that there are ways that like you can protect your artwork from those types of things. And if you don't get permissions, if it's not out in the open source or open form or whatever, it's not there to be used. And that's, and that's the difficulties. That's not every program that you use to generate AI art had, like respects those things and then yeah. we'll still pull from them. So that's the question. And that's the concern. So like, I know on Kickstarter now, 
and I think GameFound may be doing it too, that if a company uses any kind of AI generated art, they have to be explicit. They have to be, they have to be explicit in the page. They have to say what they did. And I think they have to even explain like how they used it and what prompts and stuff like that they used. I'm not sure if they have to say like what prompts and stuff they used, but I think they have to talk about like what programs and stuff they used. Um, and I think like Kickstarter has like stuff in place to make sure that they're not using programs and software that don't respect those things. So like I only say that to say that stealing isn't necessarily happening all the time. And that's a that's a that's a fine line. I think if you're going to, I think a, like maybe perhaps a small creator, like one of us wants to design yeah. a game, right? And we only have our brains to think of mechanics of a game, but we don't have a way to put, you know, to visualize it, right? To visualize the design of a game. Visualize it well. Right. You know, or to put it into the world in a way that is like going to help you actually continue designing the game i think it would be fine to print out some cards with ar art that you use prompts that are relevant to your game that you are using privately in a design aspect and then you know later on if you're going to move on with your game via kickstarter via you know propose or what's it called not proposing trying to get funding and you know from a publisher or whatever that's where I personally would take to be like, hey, also, this is all this is all AI art that I use. I would rather get a real artist to, you know, do the art for my game. If we if we don't, this is what we're gonna get for Dwayne's game. This yeah. is the art that we're gonna produce. And I think there's an inspirational aspect to art that you cannot deny, you know, because I'm sure we've all seen pictures that we go, Whoa, that is awesome oh my gosh, that makes me think of this and I'm so inspired by that. I am I know personally I'm not going to be inspired by whatever I could put onto a page or, you know, onto yeah. a digital tablet. So it just is not going to help with like, um, not innovation, but, you know, sparking any kind of inspired design. Yeah. I, I think that, I think that's absolutely right, right? Like it's, it's, I think it's easier for a person with an idea to describe that idea to a computer and say, hey, look, I want this art style. I'm looking for these things and whatnot. And like, here you go. And to help put those visuals together, right? And then vice, like, even if you were to have the money to hire an artist and sit down with them and be like, all right, hey, so here's my idea for this game. Here's my concept for the artwork. Are you familiar with this kind of artwork? Okay. All right, hey, so for this card, I'm looking for this. And this, I'm looking for this. And you may end up spending hundreds of hours and a lot of money investing, like going down a train or down a road with this, this person to find out that like, honestly, they're not, they're not the artist you're looking for. Yeah. This and isn't, this isn't the right fit. As opposed to being able to like get the computer to a 85% solution and then be like, Hey, can you make this art your own? Did you just erase that? Arduino is hiding his art from us. I saw it. It was actually, it was, wow. It was way better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say it was good, but it was better than mine. as a low bar. I, I think I tend to agree. I think both of you said it at this point. If you're small, if you're a small company. If you're a small boy. If you're a small boy. Not as <laughs> Uh Yeah. <laughs> Go for it. Use the art. Honestly, if you, depending on how small it is, if it's your first project and whatnot, depending on what you're doing, especially depending on what the art load is. Like if you were talking about like, <clears throat> I am just printing a thousand unique cards for a card game, right? Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. Right. And you know, card games don't make a lot of money. You you know, they don't. Uh, you can just look at again, crowdfunding and stuff and get the data to see like how much you're going to lose or how much, I mean, how much you're going to make on that. So like, yeah, if it's your first time and you're just trying to get ideas out there. Yeah, man, just let everybody know you're using AR, make sure you're using it responsibly. Do it. That's fine. Second time around, maybe you can use it as a framework as a, Hey, like I want this and then go find the artist to do it. But yeah, there's a certain point 
And I don't, honestly don't know what it, I really don't know what it is. I don't know where the cutoff is where it's like, hey, you now have a fiscal responsibility to pay your, like pay an artist, a full-time artist or whatever to render your stuff for you. I don't really have a good idea. I don't know if that's once your games are making 200000 hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 in profit. I don't know. I don't know. I'm running away with all of it. You'll never see me again. <laughs> there will be signs. <laughs> there will be signs. There will be signs. <laughs> What's the, um, there was a, an artist who got fined and he had to return the money. Someone found him? You what a stupid joke. <laughs> Are you he, was, he was fined? Oh my gosh, when was he lost? <laughs> God, that was terrible. No, he was commissioned and he was given an advance of $75,000 to paint two paintings for this um, this art museum or art, art gallery or whatever and literally delivered two blank white canvases and said... The title is like "Run with the Money" or something like that. Yeah, take the money and run. Or That's something like fucking that. hilarious. He got, he got, yeah, he got in trouble. Yeah, but I mean, what a troll! It's so <laughs> funny, <laughs> but it's awesome though because, like, I mean, first of all, like, imagine being an artist, like, good enough that somebody's going to advance you seventy and then you do that thousand dollars to paint again. two paintings. They don't even know if they're good. They just say, "Hey, man, here's seventy five k paint." That's so fucking funny. That's awesome, dude. All right. Well, if you made it this far, <laughs> just like that guy took that money and ran, we are going to take your view and hopefully you like and subscribe and we are going to get out of here. Thanks for watching the Board and Scale podcast. You can follow us on Instagram. Go you know, follow head. Follow head. Go ahead and follow. <laughs> go ahead and follow Kevin and Dwayne as well. Wait. I'm gonna, oh, we are not done yet. I just want to try it. Try what? My little... Oh, you had an idea, right? Bum, bum, bum. Surprise from Dwayne. We lied? It's quick. He lied. We're not done. It's quick. All right. It's a little little game. Okay. I'm not going to say I created it because I saw it on TikTok. But... (laughs) Which is going to be banned in America soon. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's not. It's called... It's called Don't Say It. Don't. Okay. I don't know if that's what it's actually called, but that's what I'm calling it. Don't say it. Now we can either write this down or we can go just go three, two, one. You'll say it at the same time. Three, two, one. All right. Okay. So I've got five things, five topics. Okay. I'm going to say it. And if you say the same thing that I wrote down, you're out. Okay. And let's just see how far you can get. Okay. Okay. I think I understand it. So you're going to give us a topic and we just say the first thing that comes to mind. What are you going to count us down? I'll, I'll, one I'll word, count you all down. One word, phrase. You'll see. Okay. You'll see when, when the All first right. thing comes up. Okay. Name a deck building game. Five, four, three, two, one, go. Clank. Millennium Blades. Oh! I put Clink Catacombs. That counts. That counts. That's the same thing? I think so. Same spirit of the game. It'd yeah. be like if you said Dominion. Prophecy. Clank is clank is clank is clank. You know, different versions are different versions. But oh, oh, we were not supposed to say. You don't want an obvious one. You don't (laughs) want to say the same thing, dude. There's a lot of them. I mean, I I was like, like, I was like, clank, easy. (laughs) Dominions. That's fine. I don't think I had another idea in my head anyway. So, so I lose. Yeah, you're out. You just see how far you can get. Yeah. So you got zero. (laughs) (laughs) Let's go. You know what? It's. This is it's, it's, it's the first, inaugural one. It first count. game, first game. So my win on this one's getting Bound. an asterisk. That's bullshit. No, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate you. Name. You should keep going though. Let's see how far I yeah, can let's go. go. Let's see. Yeah. Name a nature themed game. Five, four, three, two, one, go. Arboretum. Habitats. I said parks. Nice. If you said parks, you were out. Oh, we're good. Name a game in the Battle of the Games lineup. Five, four, three, two, one. Cthulhu, Cthulhu, Cthulhu. Wars. Oh. That's fine. We're not supposed to say the same as each other? No, he, no we don't fine. know. It could be. Oh, okay. Funnily enough, I put Boone Lake. Oh, shoot. Yeah. 
I mean, if you had if it had not if we had not just played that one, that would have been a good one because, well, no, it would have been a, yeah, because like I would have probably guessed that one because it was harder to think of. I don't know. All right. Next up, name a Lacerda game. Five, four, three, two, one. Lisboa. Lacrimoso. That's not a Lacerda game. It's not. <laughs> you got one real quick. It's the only one I know is Kanban. Is that his? Yeah, it is. And I'm sure that's the one you picked. So Kanban? Uh, no, I don't. I don't fucking know any of those. Is On Mars his? Like yeah, I think so. One of the most complicated yeah. games on the fucking planet. Yeah. We'll go with On Mars then, because I'm, I'm sure you're going to pick on And what did you say? Lisboa. I wrote The Gallerist. <laughs> uh, I would have been fine with Kanban. All right. I almost said The Gallerist. Lacrimosa. Because I, fi- I figured y'all would have thought I put The Gal or, or Kanban. Kanban. Yeah, that's a good. I mean. L- Lacrimosa is not. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I'm kind of second guessing my on Mars. We'll look at it later. <laughs> wow. I feel I think it is. Well, I would have been all right with Kanban too, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so it's interesting. So like the way you're thinking about it, like thinking I'm th- like I'm the most obvious answer of, yeah. is not necessarily a bad one because the problem is is that if like you think it's really obvious and he does too, but he thinks it's more, less obvious than you do or more on whatever, I guess. I don't know. Reverse right. psychology. Yeah, it's mm, the and fringes then, might be more dangerous. Last but not least, name a cooperative game. Five, four, three, two, one, go. Flash, Flash of point. darkness. Pandemic. I have to say, pandemic was, was that like, is mm, the, that was the, the big one. Game. Yeah, it's funny because I picked Flashpoint, which is pandemic, but fire. firefighters. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> All right. I dig it. That was fun. Now you can go. Yes. Now you are free. (laughs) You are released from your prison of this YouTube video. Hey. uh... Clap sync. Goodbye, everybody. (laughs)